I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Dennis Slayman. Thank you, John, for uh, those very kind words. Uh, will I direct from this little... Um, actually, if we can turn the lights back on for a moment before we use any AV uh, aids. I, I, I've done this once before here in Ireland, and I did it without slides, uh, just sort of discussing things. But I thought tonight maybe I'd use a few um, audiovisual aids because the last time I found that the audience was better informed than some of the medical audiences that I discuss things with. Uh, um, uh, in Ireland, the, the art of reading and gathering information has not been lost like it has been in the U.S. Uh, so um, what I want to do is, is, is talk to you about uh, a bit of a journey uh, that we've traveled together. Uh, as John mentioned the close collaboration we have with the Irish Cooperative Oncology Research Group, i -Court, And that developed years ago. And because of that collaboration, we were able <coughs> and excited to engage uh, Irish physicians and scientists in some of the research we were doing, and they engaged us with some of the stuff they were doing um, that allowed us really to move things along even faster and, and without question that it would otherwise have moved along. And I'll, I'll give you an example or two of that tonight. So um, those of you, <clears throat> many of you are at a lecture about cancer, so you probably have some either personal or uh, family interest in, in this disease, uh, but you should be happy to know that you have uh, among the best physicians and scientists working on this problem in the world, bar none. And it's been a pleasure to work with them, and that's why it's a pleasure to be here with you. <clears throat> now, when you try to understand the problem of cancer, um, you uh, have to walk this journey a bit. When we first started with dealing with the disease, we thought it was one disease, cancer. It, and uh, then we got probably a little more sophisticated that said, well, it's cancer of the lung, of the breast, of the stomach, of the pancreas, the uterus, colon, et cetera. So <clears throat> they're different in that respect, but, but within each of those categories, it's one disease, colon cancer or lung cancer or breast cancer. And we could not have been more wrong. And we probably should have understood that we were wrong by virtue of the fact of just clinical observation, that if we followed our patients who presented to us challenged with these diseases and treated them with sort of the uniform approaches we're treating for each one of these different cancer types, um, <clears throat> we'd gotten sophisticated enough to realize maybe the treatment for colon cancer might be different than the treatment for lung cancer or the treatment for breast cancer. So we'd gotten to that level of sophistication, but when we treated patients within each one of those organ cancers, the outcomes were quite variable with some patients, in the case of breast cancer, some women doing very well and other women doing poorly. And it wasn't so much because they had a good doctor or a bad doctor or good luck or bad luck, but it wasn't relatively late in the game that we realized that we were dealing with a spectrum of diseases within that silo of breast cancer. And that really sounds simple to say now, but <clears throat> it took a while to get the field to the point that it accepted that. <clears throat> now, if you think about what happens in the problem of cancer, it's uh, uncontrolled unrestricted, unregulated growth, and cell growth. And cell growth is something that happens to all of us every day. Um, when you think about conception to birth, you go from a single cell to literally trillions in a very brief period of time. Uh, but that doesn't mark the end of cell growth. Cell growth continues the rest of our lives, and different organs grow at different rates in terms of populating some. Some organs tend to be more static, once you've got most of the neurons you're going to have in your brain, that's, that's it. The heart muscle doesn't tend to repopulate very easily, which is why when people have heart attacks, they sustain damage to the heart that can cause problems subsequently. <clears throat> so there are cells that don't continue to grow through our lives. But there are other cells that grow quite vigorously. Um, you may not know, and I, I used this example the last time I, I gave the public lecture, that during the course of the day today, your bone marrow will have made some uh, 15 to 17 billion new white cells, um, the cells that defend you against bacterial infections. Uh, and if you 
get a, an infection, uh, your system has a, a really unique uh, mechanism of recognizing something foreign in the body and there are other cells that are specialized to produce substances called cytokines that are released and go to the bone marrow and stimulate it to produce more white cells so you'll go from 17 billion to about 40 to 50 billion in the course of just a matter of a few hours now cytokines are why you feel so badly when you get a, a flu or an upper respiratory tract infection they make all the aches and pains and things but they also are proliferating those cells. When the infection is cleared, a signal goes back to the bone marrow that we've cleared the infection, no more cytokines are produced, the cell proliferation stops. That's one organ. This happens in many organs in the body, the entire gut, lining of the gut, from the mouth all the way through uh, to uh, uh, the rectum, has a proliferating surface epithelium that's turning over constantly. Uh, the biggest organ in the body, the skin, turns over constantly. Hair follicles, at least for some of us, uh, turn over <laughs> constantly. So these are all things that happen every day that we really don't think about. It's growth, phenomenal cell growth, but it's regulated growth, tightly regulated and orchestrated by a series of genes called growth factors and growth factor receptors. And they are attached to the outside of the cell to receive signals from the outside telling the cell what to do. And then there is something called the signal transduction pathway that's the wiring that goes from that sort of antenna system receiving signals down to the nucleus to tell the cell to grow and proliferate. Um, now, with regards to breast cancer, there isn't a woman in the room that doesn't know that the breast is one of the most dynamic organs in the body in terms of growth. Uh, Premenopausally, every month, um, you felt the changes that happened in the breast. And that was due to proliferation, uh, growth of cells that were proliferating in anticipation of a potential pregnancy with the menstrual cycle. And if a pregnancy ensued, there was another burst, significant burst of growth that prepared the breast for lactation. And if lactation ensued, uh, there was yet another change in the cells in terms of specializing to produce milk. And when breastfeeding finished, another signal went to cause involution of those cells that had, had grown. And this happens uh, without the, uh, um, the intervention of a pregnancy coming. This happens monthly, and if a pregnancy happens, then all during the pregnancy, and then lactation and breastfeeding, um, there's all these changes in the cells. So a phenomenally dynamic organ in terms of growth. Again, tightly regulated. And if something goes wrong or is broken, in this regulation, you can again be off to the races with the problem we know as breast cancer. So I wanted to sort of give you those general comments that tell us how we started to approach it. Now, when we recognized that this was uh, a problem uh, in growth, uh, we devised initially some therapies that were uh, based on using poisons, for want of a better word, cytotoxic agents, chemotherapy, stop these rapidly proliferating cells. But based on what I just told you, you can anticipate what happened when we administer those things. We certainly can impact some cancers, and some cancers we can even cure with this approach. But since it's directed at proliferating and uh, uh, dividing cells, you can imagine that we have an impact on normal tissues that are also proliferating. So the side effects that patients experience when they go through chemotherapy in terms of the nausea, the vomiting, the problems with the gastrointestinal tract, the loss of hair, the problems with the follicles that are reproducing cells, the problems sometimes with skin, um, and then the problems with the bone marrow, the cells that are turning over and proliferating there, suppressing those and making those white counts low, uh, making the red counts low, making sometimes the platelets low, to the, sometimes to the point that we have to intervene with transfusions or growth factors to help the patient cells grow. So, it was an approach, and it was an approach that started in the 1950s, and John's doing uh, a bit of a documentary about this uh, that talks about the history of oncology and how we got there. And, and um, I, I learned today, I knew the story of how we first developed chemotherapy, but I, I got a chance to meet the individual today who was at uh, Bari Harbor, I guess, uh, that uh, uh, experienced uh, firsthand 
how we learned that there were chemotherapeutic things that could suppress cell growth. And that was the um, horrible and sort of unlikely offshoot of, of mustard gas when it was used in the war. For those people who were exposed very close to the gas uh, and didn't have masks on, they usually succumbed quite quickly. But people who were a little bit of a distance and got lower doses became ill later with blisters and burns on the skins and with decreases in white cells and problems with their gut lining. And that was because some of the gas had gotten in not enough to kill them, but enough to poison the cells that were proliferating. And we learned that this agent, nitrogen mustard, that is the active agent in mustard gas, could be used as a therapeutic if used carefully, albeit causing the side effects we're talking about. So that led to the first drug, and then there were subsequent drugs. And, and these drugs that we use, chemotherapy, can in fact cure patients. Patients with Hodgkin's disease, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, childhood leukemia, some adult leukemias, testicular cancer. You all know the story about patients with advanced testicular cancer, even metastatic disease widely throughout the body being cured with combination chemotherapy. But the reality is for the major cancers in terms of incidence, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, uh, breast cancer, we don't cure advanced disease. We may be able and do improve cure rates for early disease if we use these kind of chemotherapies early enough, but, but they come with a cost in terms of the side effects to the patient. But those costs we feel and the patients frequently feel are worth the trade-off of having the cancer progress and ultimately take their life. So <clears throat> we kept pushing our combinations of therapy further and further and kept increasing the doses of chemotherapy we gave, realizing that we are trying to cure more patients but ended up against a wall, and that wall was we were causing more damage for some patients than, uh, than good. And there were some regimens that were being used that combined not three or four drugs but six or eight drugs. And in some diseases, we found that those regimens had a worse outcome for the patient having them succumb to our treatment faster than they would succumb to the disease had we left it alone. And that's when the field, about 20 years, said we need to rethink what we're doing. Throwing in nonspecific bombs hoping to kill more, to kill more bad cells than good cells uh, isn't really going to get us further than we've already gotten with that approach. We need to rethink the disease. And, and thankfully, at about the same time, biologic research moved to the point that we began to understand we always knew that there were genes, but we're able to begin to identify those genes and study them and look at their structure and put them into cells, different genes into different cells and, and express those genes and ask what would happen and really began the, what's called the molecular era of medicine. And cancer went from being behind the pack uh, to being the front of the pack and moving that agenda forward. And that was also a very exciting time. And that's what's led to what I'll talk to you about the rest of this evening. Now, let's talk first about the uh, uh, framing of the problem. If I can have the lights now back down uh, after that introduction. We're going to talk about something called the molecular diversity of, of the disease. Wait a minute. Yeah, there it is. Um, and, and talk about what we're, the challenge we're facing. And I'm going to use for tonight the example of breast cancer, but what I'm telling you about breast cancer is largely operating in a number of other cancers, uh, albeit in different ways, uh, but it's the same general story that applies. Now, I'm showing you a picture here that what the pathologist looks at when a tumor is removed, and they make uh, sections of the uh, tumor tissue in paraffin box and study them under the microscope. And this looks like some uh, modern art to you, perhaps. Um, but what it is is what the pathologist looks at day in and day out. And what I have up here is eight different breast cancers. And even if you've never looked through the microscope before at a breast cancer, which in this case is the enemy, you can see that they look quite different one from another. Um, and what the pathologist has been able to do is for decades explain the extent of the disease, whether the malignant cells are staying within the duct, which is shown here in these large circles, and hasn't invaded outside the duct into the surrounding tissue, which is the problem when breast cancer becomes potentially lethal is when it moves outside the mammary ducts into the surrounding tissue. This is an example of when that has happened, 
that these things have invaded. Um, and this is an example of breast cancer remembering what it's supposed to be. And the malignant cells are trying to form normal ducts, but not doing it very well. So it's called a well-differentiated tumor. And then there are other tumors that are poorly differentiated. They have these cells are so malignant, they have no recollection of what they were supposed to be. And they don't even try to form anything like a duct. Uh, we look at the nuclei. We look at the margins. We look at the, uh, the cellular components. So these are all things that pathologists have been doing for decades and, and tell us as clinicians what they see. And some of them can, can carry important information telling us how we should treat the patient or whether the tumor is a high risk to recur or a low risk to recur. But the reality is it's not near as sophisticated as we need to be. And enter this new molecular error that I told you about. We can now begin to use molecular genetic information to decipher why these things look so different and, more importantly, why they behave so differently. Now, the global burden of this disease is shown here. The World Health Organization recognizes um, that it is reaching epidemic proportions. Now, before that scares you too much uh, and we wonder what are we doing wrong, uh, we are doing some things wrong to our environment and to ourselves, but we're doing several things right. Because one of the reasons the incidence of breast cancer is increasing is women are living longer. In the 1800s, women died frequently around childbirth. Um, and immediate survival of women was into the fourth and fifth decade. Um, enter the field of obstetrics and, and improvement in sterility and the infections that occur with, in, in, uh, with childbirth, uh, the care in the postpartum era, uh, and women lived into their fifth decade and sixth decade. Uh, there was a time in the 1800s when if you developed an infection, a pneumonia, man or woman, that was basically a death sentence. Um, and enter the antibiotic era, first with sulfas and then the penicillins and then all the drugs we've had since then. So that made a huge impact on life expectancy, people living into their sixth and seventh decade. And then we learned that perhaps cardiac risk, which is an important major problem that people have, was linked to controlling uncontrolled blood pressure or cholesterol or lifestyle changes. Um, and we made improvements there. And now women routinely live into their eighth and ninth decade, occasionally their tenth decade. And men uh, make it into their seventh and eighth decade clearly demonstrating that women are superior to men uh, in many respects. Um, but in the Western countries where we were doing better, uh, things were going well and women were living longer, but we were seeing this increase in incidence of the disease. But in the poorly developed or less developed world where things like clean water and sanitation didn't exist, people were still dying in their fourth and fifth decade. And as the world's changed and that's improved in all those countries, Women are now living just like they do in the West in, uh, to longer periods of time. And we'll guess what we see? A rising incidence and burden of breast cancer. Because what I told you at the beginning about cells dividing, the longer you live, the more the cells are dividing and the more they're at risk for making a mistake when they're uh, copying their blueprint in genes that are critical in regulating growth. So the global burden, and these numbers are actually a bit wrong, uh, it's 1.6, uh, a little bit north of 1.6 million new cases per year identified globally. Uh, one in five to one in six women will develop the disease, um, and one in ten of all cancers diagnosed, uh, reported to the World Health Organization, are breast cancers. So it shows you how prevalent it is, and it is not that there aren't other lifestyle changes we could do to, to decrease these numbers, but the reality is um, there's a certain thing that just comes with living longer um, that is something we need to understand, accept, and deal with. Numbers of deaths, uh, more than a half a million. Now it's getting very close to 600,000 each year. Uh, in the US, the, the numbers are 200,000 new cases reported and about 40,000 deaths. Now, the good news is with new therapies, with new understandings, with limiting the use of uh, hormone replacement therapy, We've been able to impact these numbers and decrease death rate from the disease even while the incidence has stayed flat or in some instances, in some areas, even increased. Um, now, I mentioned that the past was sort of dominated and dictated by sort of the one-size-fits-all approach to these 
different cancers, and we treated them in these silos uh, as if they were one disease. But this is a sobering graph, and I'm going to show you a few of these, and let me tell you what it is. Um, it is a survival curve, uh, looking at um, survival over time, time on the bottom shown in months, and the percent of, uh, in this case, subjects, in this case, women, in the study that are surviving without the disease recurring or coming back. And this comes from um, tumor tissues that were taken from patients for therapeutic purposes, they were cut out because they came to the clinic with a the tumor. They underwent surgery, and then they were put, rather than in the garbage can after the pathologist looked at them, they were put into a frozen tissue bank. <coughs> Sounds crazy to have a bank of tissues, but these tissue banks become invaluable things to study when the technology graduated to the point that we actually could query a piece of human tissue at the genetic level. And this happened in this particular study. And what we saw is women treated with surgery, and some got some radiation, but nothing more because these tumors were taken before the advent of adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer. Um, and we followed, uh, the, the women were followed, but before, um, uh, after they were followed uh, for long periods of time, the tumor tissues were taken out of the bank and the new technology was applied, looking at the genetic changes. And this is the natural history of breast cancer. And what you can see is there are four groups here be, that behave quite differently in terms of how long things go on before the patient has a, a recurrence. So this group in dark blue has the best outcomes. Certainly some of the patients here do have recurrences, but at a certain rate it flattens off and patients do quite well long term. There's another group that has a worse line, a group that has yet a worse line, and a group that has the worst of all four lines. And we were able to discern and decipher these all based on their molecular signature of what genes or what pathways are altered or broken. These genes and pathways that I told you regulate growth. And depending on which genes are altered or broken, the outcomes are very different. That alone uh, then really told us that we were barking up the wrong tree trying to use one size fits all approach to a disease that was quite diverse in terms of how it was behaving and that we needed really to take this into account in developing new therapies. So our original premise that cancer was a single disease was certainly blown out of the water long before, but uh, with this new molecular technology, we know that even within a given organ system, it's not one disease, but a spectrum of diseases. So as it relates back to breast cancer, we appreciated that there was a molecular diversity of the disease. <clears throat> now again, before we had all this fancy genetic cloning and genetic studies, um, there were clinical experiments and observations that we should have paid attention to. So a, a, uh, an investigator on this side of the pond, uh, this time in the UK, uh, Beetson, uh, was a surgeon back in the late 1800s that re reasoned that since women mostly get breast cancer, it's not that it never occurs in men, but it's mostly women who develop it, that maybe this was a problem related to the hormones and recognizing that the ovaries were the major source of hormones, decided Maybe in addition to cutting out the tumor when it initially uh, occurs, when the disease recurs and it's found in other organs now, maybe a treatment would be to remove the source of hormones or do the ovaries, uh, do an ovarectomy to take the ovaries out. And he did this to a woman who had advanced disease, a young woman who presented to his clinic, <clears throat> and there was a spectacular response. And at the time, you could write up a single case and get it published, so he wrote up this case about how well this woman did just from having what's called an oophorectomy, surgical removal of the ovaries. And that uh, was quite exciting, <clears throat> but uh, a second report he wrote some uh, short time later was uh, as a result of a second or third case, I can't remember, who presented to him very much the same way, who underwent the surgery and had no response. And right there, that told us that there were two different types of breast cancers, one that was being driven by the steroid hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and another type that had very little to do with the hormone receptors and was being driven by something else. So again, the idea that there was diversity was introduced early just by different clinical outcomes. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with another fact here that all cancer is genetic. Uh, but don't take away from this lecture that I'm saying that all cancer is inherited. In fact, only a minority of cancers are inherited. But it's all genetic because um, 
that is not to say that it's inherited. Only minority is 10 to 15 percent. But these alterations that occur in genes are what's critical to making cancers behave differently. And depending on which, which genes in the growth regulating pathways are broken, the cancers are different. So the gene cassette that controls hormone regulation of the breasts, for the women in the, in the audience who know that the breast changes every month, you know that change with your menstrual cycle and with the hormonal changes <coughs> during the cycle. Well, those cells that are normal are being tightly regulated by the hormone control pathway. And when that pathway goes awry, you have hormone receptor driven tumors, but they're just not driven with regular control. But it represents a class of breast cancers called ER positive or hormone receptor positive breast cancers. There are other cancers that the pathways that control growth that way are, are, are not altered, but different pathways are altered. And so what we know today is that there are probably 10 to 12 different molecular subtypes of breast cancer this thing we used to think is one disease. And take away, the other take home message for tonight is, this is not just operating in breast cancer, this operates in lung cancer, colorectal cancer, pancreas cancer, this diversity that I'm telling you about. <clears throat> but uh, today, as we sit in front of you, these 10 to 12 different subtypes really break themselves into three therapeutic approaches. The biggest piece of the breast cancer pie, that big burden I told you that's going on globally, is the hormone receptor positive breast cancers where alterations in hormone regulation is driving the breast cancer. There's another group that we were involved in identifying and then doing some work here uh, with ICORG in terms of uh, looking at called the HER2 positive breast cancers that is this group and then there's a group called triple negative or basal breast cancers that don't have appreciable hormone receptors and they don't have the HER2 alteration and I'll tell you what that is directly and show you an example of how the process of this research uh, led to thinking about how to use our therapies uh, in guided and specific ways in the different subtypes. Now, within each of these big pieces of pie, there's <coughs> diversity as well. Not all the women that are in hormone receptor positive breast cancers respond to our best available hormonal manipulations. So some do very well, and we've been successful with using that approach, but others do not, and the disease recurs, or it never responds to begin with, indicating that within the group that's defined as hormone receptor positive, there's diversity, further diversity. The same is true for the HER2 group, the same is true for this group known as triple negative breast cancer. And this is just an example of, of uh, something, it, it looks like, uh, again, maybe some modern art, but really what it is, is when we first found this alteration, it was due to these experiments where we took the different tumors from a number of different patients. In the initial study, it was uh, about uh, 30 patient samples. And rather than tossing them, we actually uh, ground them up, extracted the DNA, and studied the DNA for different genes that regulate growth. And one of the genes is called HER2, human epidermal growth factor receptor number two. That means there's a number one, and there is. It was identified first. This is a sibling of it and has two other siblings in the family, there are four. And they interact one with another to regulate the growth of cells. Uh, but we found that this of the four members of the family was altered about 25% of the time in breast cancer and defined this group in blue. Now, why is that relevant? Well, what we're seeing here is we look for the signal for the gene and we see going from uh, the right to the left that the signal intensity increases uh, as we move, indicating that there's an alteration. This is what it's supposed to be normally, but in 20 to 30 percent of the cases, we're seeing this, degrees of increase, indicating a mistake that's been made when the cell is dividing. So the Xerox machinery that copies the DNA has become stuck on a part of the blueprint that contains this gene, and that's the mistake that's made in this type of breast cancer. Too many copies of this gene gets made, it is a growth factor receptor, one of these accelerator parts of the pathway. And when there's too many copies of the gene, there's too much of the protein and too much growth. And so that plays a role in dysregulated growth. So we wanted to ask if that really was the villain here. And so we uh, looked at the outcome from the patients. And sure enough, those women, there are several now tumors here. Each lane represents a different tumor. And you can see some of them have this increased signal intensity.
And when we look in the tissue itself, we find the cells that have this very intense stain. Each one of these little circles or irregular things is an individual cell. And they have too much of this receptor. Normally, you cannot see with the staining the receptor on the membrane. Uh, but you go from 25 to 30,000 receptors, sounds like a lot in a normal situation, that when this happens, when there's too many copies, you go up to 2 million receptors. So there's a two log increase in the number of receptors. And if it's a growth factor receptor, uh, it does what exactly it's supposed to do, drive growth. Although now it's abnormal growth for the process we know is cancer. And what we found is those women whose tumors contain this, when given our best available standard therapies at the time, had a much different outcome. If they were HER2 normal and didn't have the alteration, like these tumors or these tumors, they had a median survival of 6.8 years. Now, median means that's the midpoint. Some patients, of course, live much longer, uh, decades. Other patients will live shorter. But the median, the average, the median for the group is uh, 6.8 years. But if they had this alteration at any level, the median dropped to three years. So that defined this group of patients that you saw in that early graph that had the worst outcome, the purple line that, that where patients really did poorly. Now, identifying this alteration, showing that it was associated with an outcome, told us there was smoke there, but doesn't prove that they're fire. So what we had to do was go into the laboratory and now do things in experimental models that you cannot do and would never be allowed to do correctly uh, in patients. And that is to take HER2 normal breast cancer cells and make them HER2 positive and ask if they behave differently. So we wanted to validate that this might be a target driving these tumors. So we took human breast cancer cells in the lab that were single copy expressing a normal level that occurs in the breast cancers that don't have this and all the normal tissues throughout the body. And we engineered by cloning this gene and putting in multiple copies HER2 normal into HER2 high. We mimicked in the lab what was happening in patients. This simply shows we can do it. You can barely see that these are cells because they don't stain so well, but they're individual cells here sort of stacked on top of one another like po poker chips. Um, these are in the lab. We now have engineered these to overexpress, and now you see uh, the growth characteristics change a bit. They clump up, but they have this intense staining and they can behave quite differently, as I'll show you momentarily. But what we have here is identical twins. One, however, does not have the alteration, one do does. So they're same in every way, except we've isolated the alteration. Now we can ask what happens in the lab. And in the lab, if you just look at the lower right-hand corner, is a growth curve of the cells in a Petri dish. Time in days and a number of cells in a dish. And remember I told you they're identical, except one has the alteration and one doesn't. And look at the growth differences. This is the one that does not have the alteration, the growth over time. This is the one that does have the alteration, the growth over time. It grows much more rapidly. That told us that when the alteration was present, it was making these cells behave quite differently. Enter, um, and, and those of you who are animal lovers, I, I apologize up front, but enter our other important tool in the lab, mice, experimental mice. Um, in, in another uh, Celtic country, in Scotland, a, a group of mice were identified in a farmhouse that were called nude mice, and they're called nude mice because they don't have hair. There, uh, in the wild, a mo an alteration had occurred where these genes that were coating for the hair coat in the mice were altered and lost. Their function was lost, so the mice were bare, born without hair but remained without hair for all of their life. Well, it turns out in the mouse, the genes that code for hair sit right next to the genes that code for immune function. So they were losing some of their immune function. They lived long enough to replicate, but they don't live long enough uh, normal lives because they ultimately develop infections because they have this immune defect. But because they have an immune defect, you can put living cells into them and they don't recognize them as foreign, and you now can have not cells growing in a petri dish, but cells growing in a living system. And these nude mice, rather than the farmer who identified them, rather than sort of hitting it with a shovel and, and throwing it away, uh, turned it into uh, some of the scientists at the University of Glasgow. And they started this colony of nude mice that you can keep around in the lab in sterile environments for long enough time to, to study the growth of tissues in those mice. And here they are. They are, in fact, naked. They don't have hair. 
But what we've done is we've introduced human breast cancer tissues into this living system, and we can study their growth. And here's the growth of the HER2 normal breast cancer over time. Both of these animals got exactly the same amount of the human breast cancer cells at exactly the same time, except one did not have the HER2 alteration and one did. And you can see very different tumors in terms of size, despite the fact they got the same amount of cells at the same time. So now we know in a living system, not just in a petri dish, these HER2 positive tumors are behaving differently. And if you look at metastases from this primary tumor, um, you can find that the metastatic potential of the HER2 positive tumors increases by some 200 percent, about 225 percent. So a lot of things changed when we introduced this alteration, and that told us that the reason there was smoke, the reason the alteration was associated with a bad outcome, was because the alteration was driving in large part that bad outcome. And that meant it made it a logical target for therapy. Not for all breast cancers, but for HER2 positive breast cancers. So to validate that, <clears throat> we treated um, these mice with uh, an antibody directed against that tumor. And now you're going to look at the growth of the tumor in size over time in um, days. And here is the treatment with a, uh, a control antibody that is not directed against HER2. Um, and the tumors, as you see, grow quite rapidly in a short period of time. But if we add this drug, trastuzumab, or the antibody against HER2, called Herceptin, we can completely suppress the growth. So armed with this data, we went to the US FDA and asked for permission to start clinical trials, where patients whose tumors had progressed uh, beyond our best therapy were, would be allowed to be treated with this new experimental therapy in a clinical trial, a tightly regulated clinical trial. Um, and that's when we got the green light to do it and found that, in fact, if we administer this drug to these patients, there is a big difference in outcome. And the hope was to develop more effective and less uh, toxic therapy and take this group of patients who did among the worst and really try to improve these curves somewhere closer to here. Now this is sort of the history of how this has all happened. Breast cancer, when we first treated it with just surgery and some radiation, taking it as one disease, a one-size-fits-all approach, here's the outcomes. So about 28 percent of the patients were long-term survivors. That meant, uh, in a sobering fashion, that 72 percent were not. When we introduced combination chemotherapy based on the things we learned from that terrible experiment of warfare, um, not necessarily nitrogen mustard, but other cytotoxic drugs, uh, and some brilliant work done by Gianni Bonadonna, who also on the continent in Italy did this work, treated high-risk high women with combination chemotherapy at diagnosis. The curve got better, significantly better. When we used other one-size-fits-all approaches, using additional drugs, adding it, we could improve the curve a bit, making these small but important in increases. And then there was another chemotherapy drug that uh, a number of investigators, including John Crown, was involved in, in bringing into the upfront treatment of breast cancer. And that drug had a big impact, uh, really improving outcomes in the group of women. But this is all one-size-fits-all approaches. If we took, however, the her this is another kind of chemotherapy regimen that, that gives those chemotherapies in a different way. But if we took that group of women that had the worst outcome. This is now taking all of these women as one disease. If we took those that had the worst outcome and gave a targeted therapy, the drug Herceptin, this is what we see. So we took that group and changed it from the worst outcome to among the best outcomes in breast cancer for those women whose tumors contain the HER2 alteration. Now this is very exciting news and I've gone over a lot of research in a short period of time that a number of people, not just me, I get a lot of credit, but I, I was just one of several investigators involved in this that was fortunate enough to meet people like John that were able to look at this research, look at the data, and say this is something we should try to do differently. But what's exciting is what this outcome difference has meant, and that we can do this in the group of women that are HER2 positive breast cancer. Now that's 20 to 25 percent of 1.6 million cases every year. So you can see it's a pretty big number. Uh, if we can get them access to a drug like this. We can do this for the other subtypes as well, I believe. So we stopped treating the disease as one-size-fits-all, and really, rather than achieving 
uh, cure rates in more than 50% to really try and achieve cure rates in more than 90 or 95% when we understand what's broken and address that directly. This is just a cartoon of a new Herceptin. This is the latest generation of the drug that's just been approved in the U.S. and I'm told uh, also here, John, is that correct? The EMEA has approved this drug called TDM1. This thing that looks a little like a scaffold, that's the antibody itself, Herceptin. And what has happened with this scaffold is they've attached something on it, uh, a chemotherapeutic drug called DM1. Very toxic, uh, was never ever able to move out of phase one clinical trials because it caused so many problems to the patients when it was administered, so it was put on the shelf. But some clever scientists figured out a way to couple this drug to the antibody so it stays coupled with the antibody and it's not free uh, circulating to get into cells, but it's carried sort of like a smart bomb directly to where the HER2 alteration is by this antibody. The antibody finds the HER2 receptor that's changed in these abnormal cells, attaches to it. The whole complex is internalized into the cell. There's something called the lysosome in the cell that's sort of like the processor of things from outside, uh, breaks it down. What breaks down this bond and releases the free chemotherapy directly in the cell. So it's no longer in the system, but in the tumor cell. The idea being to kill just the tumor cell. And this is the clinical trial that looked at the best available standard therapy. And one of the things I want to tell the audience tonight is when you go in a clinical trial, patients say, well, I'm a guinea pig. I don't want to do that. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yes, you are participating in a research process. Yes, you will have an informed consent process that can tell you all the bad things that might happen. But the reality is when a clinical trial moves forward, it's never moving forward without very close ethics board review and scientific board review to say that the patients in the trial are never going to get anything less than best available standard therapy compared to something that's the new therapy that we hope and with all the science that has been done up to the point of the trial, indicates it may be better. And you've got to convince your colleagues and ethics boards that that's the case before the trial is even allowed to open. So being in a clinical trial uh, frequently results, and in fact there's data that show that results in better outcomes than not being in a clinical trial. But the reality is patients were randomized to two treatments, either receiving this new Herceptin TDM1 or receiving the old Herceptin plus chemotherapy, which is the way we gave it, that gave us that really big improvement of 83%. That's not 100%. That means that there's still 17% of patients who don't do well who have HER2 positive tumors. And so those patients who had that progression were given a new combination with the standard drug Herceptin versus this new drug, TDM1. And when we did the comparison there, this is what we see. This is the best available standard therapy outcome data. Now you've become experts at looking at these curves. Um, 100% of the patients doing okay at the start of the study, and then the disease progresses for those patients that were getting our best available standard therapy versus what happens when we use this new drug that led to the approval uh, from the FDA and the EMEA of this drug for use of HER2 positive breast cancer that wasn't responding to Herceptin. And so that takes care of this piece of the pie, and it's a story that is playing itself out more times now in breast cancer and other cancers. And I'll end on, on a final, this big piece of the pie that was really uh, concerning us because it represents more than half of breast cancers. And while we felt very excited and good about improving outcomes for this group, uh, we have some strategies to think about improving outcome for this group. This is the biggest group that we need to do something for. As I said, some of these patients do well just with surgery but some have that recurrence. And even a small percent, 20 or 30 percent of this large number globally represents a huge challenge in breast cancer. And so those are the women in this group, the dark blue and the light blue, who don't do as well with the standard therapies, who have recurrences, again, early. And everything that we have been doing up to that point, based from start of the Beetson experiment, to latter-day uh, treatments where we learned that tamoxifen can block the pathway or aromatase inhibitors like letrozole or uh, arimidex could uh, block the pathway. Uh, we used those and we improved outcomes, but not near as, as much as we wanted. And we've been involved in some research recently, again, in very close collaboration with the Iris Cooperative Oncology Research Group, ICORG, uh, 
and Professor Crown led us, uh, the Iris group, uh, with us to study this drug called CDK46, a uh, long numeric name attached to it. Um, it only recently got a, a, a drug name that I can't pronounce, um, but it, it inhibits a particular enzyme that's broken not in the hormone pathway, but it's broken in a pathway that's right alongside the hormone pathway that the hormone receptor positive tumors use. And we had a panel of breast cancer cell lines in the laboratory that represent the spectrum of that diversity of the disease that we've been talking about. So some are hormone receptor positive here in the luminal group and some are the triple negatives in the non-luminal group and within each of these groups some are HER2 amplified. So we're having in the lab the spectrum of the disease we see in the clinic and we applied this drug, CDK4-6 inhibitor, to the panel to see where it might work. And sure enough, what we saw in this IC50 curve that I'll explain to you directly, diversity in response. So we add a fixed amount of drug onto the cells, and we see what concentration will inhibit their growth. And if it takes a huge concentration, the bars are very high. In fact, some of these bars are off the graph here, indicating the cells aren't responding at all. And there are some cells that have an intermediate response, and there are some cells that are exquisitely sensitive. So now that we appreciate it in this panel that we had a spectrum of the disease, we could ask which ones respond and which ones don't to this kind of blockade. And we found that it was these hormone receptor positive groups in blue that was really exquisitely sensitive, whereas the triple negatives in yellow were resistant. And that led to a clinical strategy uh, that was just presented a few months ago, initially at the European meeting in Brussels, and then just two months ago in San Antonio at the big a uh, breast cancer meeting, and as you see, the Irish Cooperative Oncology Group is re represented on these initial presentation of the data that got us all excited, and that is to randomize patients who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer whose tumors has come back. It isn't the patient failed therapy, the fer therapy failed the patient. So the tumor recurred uh, after we gave them the best available standard therapy, and so they were randomized to another form of that best available standard therapy. Um, which sometimes works, versus this new <clears throat> approach. Now, remember what I told you about a clinical trial. For ethical reasons, the women still had to get the best available standard therapy, and this was added on to it to ask would it make an improvement. So the patients were never getting anything less than best available standard therapy versus best available standard therapy plus something we hope might be better. And this is what happened. Best of it, now you're really experts in reading these curves. 100% of the patients are doing well when we start to study, and this is tracking the recurrences. And the recurrences happen quite rapidly uh, when they're getting their best available standard therapy. Um, some patients ultimately do well long term, but it's a much bigger number. Uh, this fall off of the curve doesn't mean it all failed at this point. This, <laughs> that simply means that those patients are the ones that got out this far in the curve, and we had one recurrence here but there are several ticks along the line that represent other patients that are doing quite well without any evidence of disease versus what you see here. So this is now gone through phase two testing in a clinical trial, going into phase three registration trial. And John, I, right before I came to the lecture tonight, I got a call from Rich Finn saying the first patient has been randomized and it will be open in Ireland in just a month or two for patients who have this hormone receptor subtype of breast cancer to receive this new therapy in the context of a clinical trial. And it will be i that will be running the trial here in Ireland. So you have everything that we have on the UCLA campus in the U.S. going on here. Uh, and then we're doing research on these tissues to see how it works. So I've taken you, if we can have the lights on, through a journey of what we're now doing in, in cancer research. I've used breast cancer as the example, but the same approach is going on in lung cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, pancreas cancer, where we're abandoning, to some degree, just using the best available standard therapy and really tailoring our therapy, personalizing our therapy to what's broken in the cell. Now, a lot of research has to go into identifying what's broken in the cell, and that's why I told you the HER2 story. That was an example of what that um, path was. That took from the time we made the observation in the laboratory to the first patient going into a clinical trial. Normally, I think what's frustrated the public is from an observation to a clinical approval, 
that takes usually 17 years. And for patients challenged with the disease, that's far too long. When we did the HER2 story, that took 11 years. That's too long. But from the time that we made the first observation in a lab to the first person going on a clinical trial only took four years. We think we can improve even on those numbers. And the reason it took an additional seven years is because we had to convince a lot of people that this was a valid approach. And there were people who said, no, no, this isn't going to work. We tried similar approaches in the past. And they were not easily convinced. Thankfully, for all of you, in Irish oncology, you have investigators like John Crown and those in the i group who saw the initial data, saw the science, indeed was involved in, in creating some science themselves in this area, and believed it and opened the clinical trials here that finally allowed us to enroll patients to show that dramatic difference that's led now to worldwide approval of the drug Herceptin. And I've told you about the backup drug, the new Herceptin that's coming online because of a clinical trial. And now what we're doing for that big piece of the pie, the hormone receptor positive ones, by improving treatment for that group. So it's an enormously exciting time in oncology. And the dread that was carried with the diagnosis of cancer really is changing. The reality is more than half the patients who are diagnosed with cancer today using best available standard therapy survive their cancer. And ultimately go to old age and succumb to something else. We're working in the space for that other 40 to 50 percent that the cancer doesn't behave so well, and we're abandoning the concept that it's simply one-size-fits-all therapy, that we need to personalize the therapy based on what's broken, and that when we do that, we can make a huge impact. So I think I'll uh, stop with this sort of boring scientific lecture at this point, and uh, uh, I don't know, John, if we have any time for questions, but I'll, I'll take any questions. Uh, I'm happy to stick around and take questions that are individual questions related to uh, individual tumor cases, but for the general audience, let's keep the questions for general uh, type things, and I'll see if we can answer either myself or John. Thank you. So the question was, how will the new Herceptin affect quality of life? And the old Herceptin, remember, is given with chemotherapy. So the Herceptin itself is an extraordinarily safe drug. And it's only when it's given with a specific kind of chemotherapy does it cause any significant problem in a small percentage of patients. But the chemotherapy still has the same old effects of chemotherapy. The new Herceptin, TDM1, is uh, having the chemotherapy carried with the antibody. So it's not released to the general system until it gets to the tumor cell. So again, the smart bomb, or someone today called it a Trojan horse, um, that gets in the cell and then releases the drug. Well, your question is very good, and it gets right to the point that what's happened when we've done the clinical trials is the things that came along with the chemotherapy, the hair loss, the nausea, the vomiting, the changes in the intestinal tract, uh, the suppression of the white cells, that is largely mitigated by TDM1. So the patients don't have those anywhere to near that degree. In fact, the hair loss goes, as one example, goes from 66% of the patients who are getting the chemotherapy combination to just over 4% who are getting TDM1. The suppression of the white count goes from around 65% uh, down to about 17%. So these huge changes in the things that we used to have to get through patients through uh, in chemotherapy combinations is now changed. Now, TDM1 has been approved, make no mistake about it. You can't go tomorrow if you have a HER2 positive tumor, initially diagnosed and say, I want TDM1. It's been only approved for advanced disease. Patients who have, uh, for whom we failed with the best available standard therapy of, of Herceptin plus chemo. But there is a study that will open later this year that the i group will be working together with us on that's going to move that right up front. 
So when the patient's initially diagnosed, they're going to be randomized to best available standard therapy versus TDM1. Um, and that trial will launch, uh, um, we hope, in August of this year uh, to enroll patients that are initially diagnosed so we can move the treatment up front. You want to add, John? Just to say that patients that are currently on Herceptin shouldn't be asking to change. If your cancer is doing well with Herceptin, there is no need to change. If your cancer, sadly, has failed to respond to Herceptin, we increasingly are getting access to TDM1 through a number of other mechanisms for people who need it if, if they're one of the group where Herceptin has, has stopped working. Remember, we're working in that space of, we went up to 83%, so we're working in that 17% space now, so John's point's well taken. It's only for those patients that have been improved now for whom Herceptin is not working. It still works very well for a lot of patients, but we think that if in the clinical trial we showed that we go above 83% in early disease to 90, 95%, we'll no longer be using the old Herceptin, we'll be using the new Herceptin and kick that curve up even higher. Yes, there was a question. So the objective when we give uh, treatment systemically, either with a pill, like you saw with the CDK inhibitor, or with a drug that's given intravenous like a Herceptin or TDM1, is to treat both the primary disease, but that's already been treated mostly by surgery, but if the margins are still positive, but more importantly, if cells have escaped, so the secondary disease, the metastatic disease, is really the thing we try to deal with, the systemic therapy deals with that, and that's what it's directed at. So I heard most of the question. Uh, the is it a big variety of cancers in the future? Or does cancer DNA make less cells to get there? So what we think is going to happen, we certainly are going to improve cure rates, and that's good. But based on what I told you, the fact that we're living longer, we're never going to eliminate the disease. Um, the, the dolly the sheep experiment that, that has a lot of ethical <coughs> concerns, but scientifically you can take a skin cell from a sheep and replicate that whole animal because all the information is contained uh, in that skin cell. And every time the cell divides, it's got to do it perfectly, like I said earlier in the lecture. And the longer the animal lives and the longer the human lives, the more chance there is for an error. Now, if the error occurs in random parts of the genome that aren't critical, you don't get a problem. Or if, for example, the genes that code for my brown eye color are mutated in my skin, where they're not expressed, there's no problem. But if the genes that regulate growth are mutated in that part of the skin, then I can have a problem like a basal cell carcinoma or a melanoma. If it happens in the breast in women, it's breast cancer. Uh, in the bone marrow, it can be leukemia. So th if the critical genes that regulate growth get mutated, that happens. So we're always going to have that problem. And the longer the look we live, the more we're at risk to develop that. But we're therapy is going to become much more sophisticated, less toxic, and for those patients who we don't cure, and we hope to cure many at the outside of diagnosis, the objective will be to control the disease so it turns into a chronic disease, not a killer, but a chronic disease that can be managed. Yes? So I think I heard most of it. What was it again, John? Triple negative. Triple negative, okay. Sure. Well, triple negative breast cancer is an interesting story in and of itself. So when I showed you those outcome curves in that first early slide when we were using one-size-fits-all therapy, so the triple negative was in red. So it tracked close to what the HER2 was tracking. It also tracked poorly. Um, the truth is that if you take that 15 to 18 percent of women who have triple negative breast cancer and use standard therapy, about 40 to 45 percent do extraordinarily well. The tumor goes away and they are long-term survivors out to 10 years and more. And the tumor never comes back. So those patients may well be cured of their disease. However, in the triple negative group, there is about 55 to 60 percent where the tumor not only comes back, but it comes back quite quickly, within three years. And it marches through everything. It doesn't respond to anything we throw at it. Now, we can only 
identified as one group triple negative and blending those bad ones with the good ones makes the total outcome look bad. And we don't know how to select the ones that are going to do very well with our traditional therapy versus those that are doing poorly. But that research is ongoing in several laboratories, including here in Ireland. So we're trying to identify it, and we're also trying to identify new targeted therapy for the group that does recur quickly and marches through all our therapy. And um, maybe uh, the next time I'm able to come to visit John, uh, we'll be talking about some of the new treatment options we have there because there are some exciting things happening. Your question is absolutely on target, just like targeted therapy is on target. Um, um, we need to really think about that as a society, and especially in enlightened societies like Ireland, despite the challenges you've had, um, you at least offer universal health care, which we do not do in the United States, except for patients that are 65 and older with Medicare. So I think you're advanced beyond us. Um, ultimately, I hope uniform care will come to the U.S., and uh, despite the lobbies that fight that. Now, having said that, once society is paying for these drugs, um, there are some real decisions to be made in terms of how much do they cost. Do the companies that develop these drugs, which are private companies that have investors, do they deserve a return? Absolutely. But what's the magnitude of that return and how big should it be? Uh, everybody has their own fix and solution. And my own is that the magnitude should be directly linked to the degree of benefit. And if you've only benefited a few percent, you should only be paid a little bit more than best available standard therapy. But if you made a big impact, then there should be some kind of multiplier that acknowledges the fact that you've invested in this risky research. But still in all, the, the drugs and the treatments are way out of kilter to what society can afford. Um, there's data indicating that in the US, uh, if the current rate of medical care costs, and drug drives a big part of that, that we are now consuming uh, about 18% of gross national product on health care, that um, in a couple of decades we will be consuming 100% of gross national product at the current growth rate. So there's no question that has to be regulated. And I think there are committees, and it started in a number of countries, the UK has a committee that has an acronym, and John can tell you what it stands for because I don't remember, but it's called the NICE Committee. And, and the, the, the public really rankled at this committee at first, but they actually make this decision. They say, yes, the drug's approved, but we're not going to pay for it. If the patient can pay for it or has private insurance can pay for it, you can get it. But there's not a big enough difference that society should pay for the drug. And that really has forced the companies to say, let's go for what we call in the states a long ball. Let's go for the big effect. And that's a good thing. John, you want to add to that? All I would say is that one of the drugs that NICE said no to was Herceptin. Uh, it was they were, they were ultimately outflanked on that, I think. But I, 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 I have to tell you that I have been a big proponent of, it, of availability of cancer drugs, but I believe we are seeing an era of predatory pricing emerging right now. I think as well as what Dennis said in terms of a linkage between the, if, the, the effect and the price, there needs to be a link between the price and the cost of developing the drug. Uh, and there needs to be some appropriate percentage markup. In fact, right now it's happening with the big companies. It's being driven entirely by the marketing departments to do a calculation on what is the maximum price we can charge and get away with it. The people will still say we want it. The people will agitate for it. And we need to change that. And I have a, a very simple solution for it. I, I believe that the Western community of countries who really are the market for 90% of all drug sales should probably get together and say to the drug companies collectively, there actually is an amount of money beyond which we just will never pay. So work out a way to get your pricing within that because we can't afford to go beyond 40 or 50,000 or whatever it is. There are some cancer drugs coming out now which were not expensive to develop, where they're talking about costs of 80 to 100,000 per annum, which I think is nothing short of predatory pricing and is wrong, and it's something we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to deal with our time problems tonight too, with two more questions, and I'm sorry about this. I'm seeing, okay, I'll, I'll go as far as a few quick ones. In general, we have historically not had a problem in Ireland with access to cancer drugs. In a health system which, in general, I would have to say was best described as being mediocre. It was not the third world, the way people talk somewhat hysterically about it. It was mediocre by European standards. One shining thing we had was good, example, good access to cancer drugs. 
And that sadly is tightening up quite a bit for obvious reasons pertaining to the economy. Now we've fought the fights which need to be fought and I must say Minister Riley, I believe has been proactive in approving drugs which really do look good despite on some occasions getting advice that he should not. And one of the drugs was Kaleidico, the drug for cystic fibrosis and another one was the IPI drug for, for melanoma. I think he deserves credit for personally making decisions to push those through, but it's gonna get harder and harder as newer drugs that are more expensive but be, become victims of our own success. Say again. So yes, there are new targeted uh, drugs for kidney cancer. Um, the um, serafinib uh, and sunitinib being two drugs that are targeted. Now, they've done better than the best available standard therapies, but we know that there's a lot of room further in kidney cancer, and that's an area of active research at several centers, including our own, to look at other targeted therapies. Interestingly enough, preliminary data from the lab, no clinical data yet, indicate that the CDK strategy may also work there. So that's being tested. Again, interesting, the four really promising drugs that each have added meaningful, modest but meaningful improvements in outcome for kidney cancer became available over the last five years for cancer for which there was no good treatment before. Mice said no to every one of them. In the back? Uh, then we'll go to the back, someone's been patient, okay? So Herceptin, uh, the question is Herceptin a maintenance drug or a cure? Um, cure is a term that we always use cautiously. Remember the clinical trials that made that curve look so good are really only about eight years old. So we're following the patients out further. We want to start talking about cures after a decade of no recurrences. But I think we're approaching that. And we already have patients that are out 19 years without recurrences who have been treated with the drug. So we're sure the potential for cure is there. And as John and his colleagues have been recently studying, even in the advanced setting, some of these patients can be cured. Um, but clearly, it can work as a control agent. Now, the question is how long do you continue it uh, after there's no longer any evidence of disease? And we don't have a good study to show that, that. What we do in the US and at our center is usually after about three years of no evidence of disease in patients who had advanced disease, but we show that it's all has gone away by scans we stop the drug and watch. In the back, this gentleman was very patient. Um, do our factory assisted administration and exercise patients abroad have any impact on performance in the first place? So if I heard the question correctly, are, is exercise In the performance of Receptin, I can't tell you because that study hasn't been done. What I can tell you is in breast cancer in general, there's little question that uh, changes in lifestyle can make an impact. And there are studies that have been done, epidemiologic population-based studies, that show that exercise in every decade of life in patients who have breast cancer can improve outcomes. A very compelling study called the Teachers Study, where teachers were queried and followed for their health all of their life through their teaching career as part of their job and they were divided into those, not randomized, but those who did exercise and those who didn't, and then they were tracked for outcome and found that there, there is this impact. So living a healthy lifestyle certainly is important. It is not a panacea. It doesn't make the, drug, the disease go away, but it certainly can improve outcomes, and I think the same will be true with rational nutritional uh, approaches to things. John, you want to add to uh, All the projections are that because of the demographics of our society that the, after smoking cessation, the biggest thing that we could do to reduce the expected major increase in the number of cancers in this country due to population issues, not due to any toxin causing it, in the next 30 years is to avoid obesity. Uh, obesity and increased dietary intake, high cholesterol, high sugar, these are all being increasingly linked to the causation uh, of many cancers, including breast cancer. Uh, and in fact, there are data, as Dennis said, that even if you've been diagnosed with breast cancer, it's not good to be obese. It's good to try and get your weight under control, even if the diagnosis of breast cancer has already occurred in terms of the risk of it coming back. I, I will we'll take one from you, and then I'm going to exercise affirmative action and only take questions from women for the next two. <laughs> <laughs> it's Title IX in the US. <laughs> 
So a three-part question. The question is, uh, how is it given? Is it given daily? It's not. It's given uh, now every three weeks. So the half-life of the drug, once it's administered, sticks around for a long time in the circulation at levels that are therapeutic. Uh, currently, for early breast cancer, it's given for a year, and then it's stopped. Uh, probably we can get away with a little less than that, not a lot less than that, uh, maybe nine months. And in a drug that's so expensive, it is important to take the duration of therapy into consideration of what's absolutely necessary. But that has to be answered in clinical studies, and that's being investigated as we speak. And the question was, if you're taken off it, do you recur? Uh, yes, some patients do, but some patients do not. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned, the longest living survivor uh, that was HER2 positive breast cancer had widely metastatic disease, is now alive 19 years out. Uh, she was in the phase one clinical trials. She entered those clinical trials when she was told she only had 12 weeks to live. And that's because her lung was full of breast cancer uh, that had metastasized, and she uh, had not had success with all of our standard therapies. She went into the clinical trial. She only received 18 weeks of treatment. So we know that sometimes short duration can work quite well because she's been treated with nothing for 19 years and has enjoyed her grandchildren and now even one great-grandchild. So uh, um, it doesn't have to stay for a duration. Um, we don't know yet how uh, the patients that do have a recurrence when we take them off recur, but there are new treatments like TDM1 that's sitting as a safety net for those patients where things can be tried, and there are other strategies coming. So again, a good question. Uh, uh, along TDM1, which is targeting things specifically, uh, what's blurring now is this identification of cancers by tissue site. So an interesting story along the HER2 story is that the alteration, and we saw this early on, but we couldn't talk the company in doing a clinical trial. About 17% of gastric cancers and esophageal cancers have the HER2 alteration. And it turns out that Roche, one of the good things when Roche took over the drug from Genentech is they executed a clinical trial in uh, gastric cancer. And sure enough, uh, it is beneficial and does make a big impact in those patients. So um, we were trying to explain this to a patient about how it worked. And he said that he'd been on the internet. It was a patient who had esophageal uh, cancer. He said, OK, let me simplify what you're telling me. I have breast cancer of the esophagus. So. <laughs> He was pretty close to right. It's not the, the tissue, it's the pathway that's been broken. And in this case, it was the HER2 pathway, so HER2 targeting is what was needed. And so TDM1 is going to work in other cancers. But just like that, other pathways that are broken that may be identified in cancer A could also be broken in other cancers, and the approach will be blurring rather than by histology, treating based on the pathway that's altered. And that's why some of the new technology in looking at the pathways in cancers have become so critical. 